Uh. Ooh, yeah. Drop that beat. It's time to meet DP. And welcome, guys, back to another episode of DP and Me. I'm DP, and who's me, you ask? It is me, the Ravenous Spectre. Greetings and salutations to you all. Yes, Ravenous Spectre, another great YouTube channel that I've recently discovered that has almost 100 subscribers. And I want to help see this guy get past that goal. I want to uh, support him any way I can because he does some good videos. And unlike Kamikaze Soundwaves, you can actually spell his name. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, tell us all about your channel. Well, it really is pretty much a variety kind of channel, if you will. It focuses mainly along the lines of gaming. Um, Sometimes I'll have some rants in there. I'll have some random stuff that's going on in there. I'll do some pickup videos as well. I'll do some streaming also of various games. I'm not really one of those people that goes and does a complete playthrough of a game and does video after video, but I do happen to throw in some streams in there every now and then of random games. Uh, Every once in a while, I may end up talking a bit about pro wrestling or heavy metal or anime or may do a game review here and there or a movie review here and there. There was one series that I had that was going on for quite a while until it really wasn't getting any views, so I didn't really spend too much time on it, which was Journey Onward, which is basically just me discussing my week in gaming and and the different experiences and things that I've had. So yeah, it's kind of it's kind of along those lines of just being a variety kind of show that focuses mainly along the uh, industry of gaming. Yeah, I've noticed that you do have a large variety of different things that you record. I noticed most recently you've been kind of on a pickup video craze lately. I don't know if it's just a uh, fact that maybe you're just getting a lot of stuff recently and that's why you're doing those, or or I don't know if maybe you're kind of gravitating towards that kind of content recently. But I, I like watching that kind of stuff. It's, I mean, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, yeah, I really do appreciate it. Uh, Well, the main thing is that there is a a few Goodwills. It's actually probably, I think, within maybe a 20 mile, not a 20 mile, maybe, yeah, uh, I I didn't mean 20 mile. I meant like maybe a 20 minute radius or something that's around us. And uh, sometimes I'll end up finding some really good pickups. As a matter of fact, I ended up finding three games there tonight, and they're actually over in the kitchen right now. Uh, one of them is uh, Deus Ex on PS2. There is a Dragon Ball Z Budokai game in there as well. And there's also another one called Extermination, and they were all like maybe five dollars a piece. Oh, and nice. So, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you go to that's one thing. <laughs> that's one thing I've actually kind of been mentioning lately in some of the in some of the pickup videos that I've had because some of the things that I've been finding there, I'm like, if you guys happen to have any goodwills around you, you could definitely end up finding stuff there because people are donating stuff all the time to those places. So you never know what you might find. You may actually end up finding some hidden gems. Just make sure you end up checking the inside the cases and check the disc first before you buy them. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, definitely. I, you know what? I rarely ever see anything at Goodwill. But you know what? There is something I do want to talk about Goodwill a little bit later. But it's uh, really interesting. I noticed you've got those Diablo 3 books now. Mm, I really yeah. want you to do like what you were talking about and get in like a robe and read them kind of like <laughs> in that kind of format. That would be really cool, I think. You know, and um, lighting can be challenging with that. But as long as you have a lot of lighting on yourself, maybe so a well-lit candle area or something like that, I think that'd be kind of cool looking. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I've been thinking about how exactly I was going to be doing that. But one of the things that kind of came to mind that I'm kind of iffy about that I started to kind of read into was if I'm if I'm reading something from a book, does it kind of fall along the same lines of, of, of like the whole copyright thing that goes on with YouTube, you know, because I would be reading something that I myself didn't actually write. So I don't know. I really wanted to do it for just an entertainment kind of thing, you know, just kind of make myself into a character and and read from the old dusty tomes, if you will, of the, of the Diablo universe and maybe take it like every few pages or so and just try to make it an interesting kind of viewing experience. But, I, uh, yeah, I totally get that because uh, YouTube, when it comes to copyright and things like that, it's, it's a crapshoot. It's a total crapshoot on uh, if you're going to get flagged or whatever. But when it comes to reading from a book, I don't think you have too much to worry about. You know, like, I mean, the chances that you'll actually get hit by something like that would be very slim. And then you can probably use the fair use argument because you're not just simply reading it, but you're making a performance. You're playing as a character reading from that tome. I think that would be something that 
could actually be argued as fair use. So I think you should be in clear on that if for some weird reason that happened. But anyways, I mean, you're just a small time YouTuber. You don't have too much to worry about. I'm sure you can build up your uh, base pretty quickly if something happened. Uh, but anyways, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put a link in the description of this podcast to his channel so you can check it out and subscribe and help this guy out. Help him get above that 100 sub mark because he needs to hit that. So um, what have you been playing recently? Well, honestly, recently, um, actually the most recent thing that I can honestly think of has been Monster Hunter Stories. Mm -hmm. I've kind of I've kind of been jumping around to a few different games and the main thing though that I really kind of gravitated towards at the moment has been Monster Hunter Stories on the 3DS. I've never been into the Monster Hunter series really. I have tried a couple of them but I never really could get into them and when I found out that Monster Hunter Stories was coming out, one of my, the main genre that I'm really into is RPGs. So when I realized that this was going to be like have like a real JRPG aspect to it, like a turn-based battle system and actually getting out and exploring the world and finding materials and crafting things and you know the usual JRPG tropes where you go and you end up buying armor and weapons and things like that. The game itself honestly on the 3DS is really gorgeous, it's really colorful, but there was something funny and I think it might be the game itself or it might be my 3DS. I actually had a problem today where, well during um, the hurricane recently, actually it was a tropical storm when it got here, I was charging all of my devices. And when my 3DS completely charged up, I just started playing this game yesterday. Now, I hadn't played it really for that long, and I didn't use my 3DS any prior after I finished charging it. So when I finally ended up starting to play it, I was playing it some yesterday, and I played it some today, and then I found out that it actually, the little light started to go red. And I'm like, what the heck? Oh, wow. I said, what's up with it? Yeah, so I don't know if it's the battery itself, or if it's the game is pulling so much power from the system, and I don't know if they'll release a patch for that or what can be done. Hmm. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping I won't have to actually get a new 3DS or something because it's actually the newer one, you know, with a little analog nipple thingy on it. Yeah. And so, but I mean, I haven't been a person who's played my 3DS a whole, whole, whole lot. So I don't know. But, but I guess if something happens with the 3DS, I guess I could make an excuse for me to get the the Samus, the uh, special edition Samus version or whatever oh. that's coming out. With, oh yeah, for with, sure. With, um, <laughs> now, yeah, as far I think it's a 2DS actually, not a 3DS, but it is the new oh, model, okay. so it does have the upgraded hardware. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's really interesting. I only have two. I have a 2DS personally, and I only mm -hmm. have two games. I've got Pokemon Sun, and I've got the Legend of Zelda: Ocarina of Time 3D. That's the mm -hmm. only games I own for. I'm not really a huge handheld gamer. Uh, mm -hmm. I, it's funny because I actually own more games for the Vita than I do the 3DS. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, like uh, it's it is really interesting to see that Monster Hunter Stories is more of a traditional JRPG kind of game, because mm -hmm. Monster Hunter has always been a game where typically you cooperate with other players in kind of an action RPG where you're hunting down these big monsters and you're trying to get like your loot um, built up. There's a lot of grinding in these games, of course. Mm -hmm. And there's also a lot of um, various missions, like hunts that you go on, uh, trying to take down bigger and bigger monsters. Uh, I always, it, it's it's a series that, uh, for some reason, was never huge over here, but in Japan, it's like ginormous. It's like the most popular game series over there right now. It's like probably more popular. Well, it's okay. Maybe it's not as popular as Dragon Quest, but I'm sure it's like number two up there. Like they get crazy about those games over there. And, um, you know, I mean, it's clearly been enough to hurt the Vita quite a bit because the PSP, as you remember, it had the Monster Hunter games. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. almost single-handedly made the PSP sell as much as the DS over there. You know, it was mm -hmm. crazy. But the things have reversed. The 3DS has been getting all the Monster Hunter games. And look up, look and behold, the Vita is not selling very well. I mean, it's selling better over there than here, but... You know what I mean? Like, it's it's a complete reversal of roles, you know, and it just shows the power of that game. Like, it really does have the ability to move systems. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm really, I'm really looking into wanting to see exactly what Monster Hunter World or something. I think that's what it's called, Monster Hunter World. That's, that's supposed to be coming out on uh, current generation platforms with like uh, the PS4, and I guess it's, I guess it's probably coming to Xbox One as well. Um, I think it's also coming to Switch. As a matter of fact, they already have a demo out for a uh, new Monster Hunter. I think it's called. Uh, Monster Hunter Double Cross or something like that. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, I'm really wondering if that's going to end up coming out uh, over here as well. But definitely, definitely interested to want to see what the new Monster Hunter is going to be like on the, on the PS4 because I've been checking out quite a bit of footage of it. Okay. So this, uh, have you, you, you have played the other Monster Hunter games, right? Or at least some of them? I've played very, very little of them, and it was actually on the PSP where I'd, uh, I'd, I'd had anything to do with them. I played very, like, extremely little. I probably haven't even really gotten really into leveling up my character or anything like that. <laughs> right, I can understand that. I imagine most people are probably played on the PSP or 3DS or the Wii, because the Wii had uh, Monster Hunter Try, which is what I have most experience from. I'm the, I've never been a huge fan of the series. I don't know what it is. Like, the gameplay seems kind of slow, if you know what I mean. Like, it's not it's not like a fast-paced action RPG. And when it comes to action RPGs, I definitely like a fast pace. That being said, I'm not opposed to slow and methodical gameplay. I'm mean, After all, I am a fan of the Souls series. But, I don't know, it's just something about the Monster Hunter games that didn't grab me. But, uh, yeah. that being said, you know, I've heard that Monster Hunter Try isn't really the best one to go with anyways. I've heard that... Uh, some of the other games in the series are better to, to play, so I don't know how yeah. true that is. Yeah, actually, I, I ended up seeing a recent review, as a matter of fact, for the for the Monster Hunter stories. Uh, IGN ended up doing it, and I think they ended up giving it like an 8.5 or 6 or 7, something like that. It was 8 point something, but they were talking about how, uh, how it was really a, a good entry point to get into the Monster Hunter series. And I was like, yeah, so I could, I could definitely see that, especially considering, uh, to me, it seems like it takes more of like a simplified, uh, I, I hate to say dumbed down or anything like that, but it just really seems like it takes more of a simplified approach to, to ease people into the series for them to be able to check out other games in the series from the past and, and up into the future. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Now, one thing that is paramount with these games is multiplayer and co-op. I mean, to your knowledge, does this game really have anything that, utilizes that i mean i'm sure it probably has some kind of online connectivity that's been in every other game of the series but is it strictly a jrpg or is there more to it there there is uh, some more to it um uh, actually look at on the back of the box here as a matter of fact uh there is it says here that you can battle against a friend with local wireless play okay. um with like the different monsters that you get from out of different eggs that you'll hash as well as using your your main monster hunter as well uh, okay it sounds like a pokemon kind of mechanic yeah, it does. It does have a, it does have a Pokemon feel to it. Definitely, well, the, a lot. I think a lot of people have actually kind of mentioned that they were like, "Yeah, it's like it's like Pokemon, kind of, sort of, maybe in the Monster Hunter universe, but it has a few little twists in it." <laughs> I got you. That I got, so. I mean, hey, I mean, Pokemon's a huge seller, so I guess why not try to <laughs> copy that formula. Yeah, the funny thing is, is like I've never been a Pokemon kind of guy. Honestly, like the only real Pokemons that I've truly ever played have been um, Pokemon Blue and Red, and some of uh, Snap. When I, I used to have that back on the N sixty four, but I hadn't really bothered with Pokemon any since then. I did try to get into Pokemon Sun at, at one point, but I just I wasn't feeling it. It's just it's just not really my kind of thing, I suppose. I gotcha. Well, one game I've been playing lately is a game called Quantum Break. Now, are you familiar with this game at all, or? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've actually been uh, wanting to see about possibly getting it, probably on PC later okay. on down the road. Even though I'm not really a PC gamer kind of guy, but for every once in a while, I might check it out. But yeah, when I used to have an Xbox One, that was one of the things that I was planning on getting, but I ended up getting rid of it before I had a chance to play it. <laughs> I totally understand. Well, um, speaking of getting Xbox One, I actually saw recently. I forgot where it was. But they have a deal where you can get Battlefield 1 with the Xbox One for like $1.99. I'm talking about the One S model, by the way, the newer one, which is a crazy good deal. Like, Microsoft, um, I haven't been talking about them a lot on the show because there really hasn't been a lot of news. You know, they've been kind of mainly just throwing out the third-party games. 
Yeah. And not right. really trying all that much. I think it's because they're trying to conserve for the uh, Xbox One X, S, X model, you know, the uh, the launch of that. They really want to focus their resources on pushing that system, I think. Mm-hmm. And um, so they've been kind of slow on that, but there have been some great deals for the Xbox One S system. So, I mean, if anybody is interested in getting one, it really is a decent system, you know. It's what it lacks in exclusive games. It does make up for with backwards compatibility, and it does have some really good features to it. You know, I kind of discussed in the last episode how you can get EA Access, which is something you can't get on the PS4, and it's actually a really nice service. And they also have the uh, Game Pass. I think I called it the Play Pass before. But that's where you have another subscription service. So, I mean, if you're somebody that doesn't have to play the latest games and you're okay with, like, subscription services, it's actually a, it's got a pretty good idea behind it. You know, there's a lot of good games you can play uh, using those services. But, uh, anyways, Quantum Break, it's made by the developers of Alan Wake. And, uh, you know, it's Remedy, of course. And it's a game that takes this really interesting premise of mixing a game with a TV show. You know, I, it, it's, it's, it's really weird. It, it, the TV show itself is only in the game. Like, as far as I understand, they haven't released this TV show elsewhere. But, uh, anyways, so you're playing the game, and then after you get through an act of the game, then it'll play like a half hour, like, well, maybe not a half hour, like a 20 something minute or so show. You know, it's just like a normal TV show. But anyways, as far as the TV show, it's really well produced, and uh, that part's pretty cool. The game, of course, looks really nice uh, for an Xbox One title. It does have a little bit of glitchiness to the graphics, and the frame rate isn't, like, top-notch. I'm sure if you're playing on a decent PC, those aren't issues you have to worry about. Or maybe the Xbox One X, whenever that comes out, maybe they'll do some kind of patch or something to, like, fix up the game to where it runs buttery smooth, you know, throughout and everything but uh that being said uh this game does have some problems so right now i just got past act two part two of the game let me go ahead and explain these problems here because these are problems that i didn't really encounter a lot until i got to this particular part of the game so i mean i don't know you if you played games where like you kind of enjoy the game until you got to a certain segment and then it just completely kind of turns it around and your opinion of the game almost changes just because of how bad this particular part was. Yeah, absolutely. I've had I've had moments like that, especially for games that have really grabbed my attention, like all throughout the process of hearing about their release and hearing and just overall hearing a lot of, of features that were gonna be in the game. And then finally when I come around to actually playing the game. It's like, okay. holy crap, I can't even, I, I get to a certain point and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. All right, so like, no, that's not, this. that's not exactly what I mean. I mean, like, when you're actually playing the game, you're having a good time at first, but then as you're playing it, you encounter issues with the game. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, like, pre-release hype and then when you play the game, it sucks, you know, or something like that. You're talking about, like, technical type of issues? Well, it could be technical or it could be, like, more of a game design uh, aspect, you know, something like that, where like you're enjoying the game at first, and then ultimately, like when you get to a certain point or something happens, like your opinion changes of that. Yeah, that actually kind of happened with the HD version of Final Fantasy XII. As a matter of fact, I uh, okay, I, I was really getting into it, and then I just got like to a certain boss fight, and I'm like, I gotta put this away for a while, and I haven't really gone back to it since. <laughs> it's just a frustrating kind of experience. Yeah, because I was like, man, I ended up grinding for an hour and a half, which actually, by the way, that's actually a stream that I have on my channel, as a matter of fact. I got it. And, um, and I was stream- I was like grinding for an hour and a half, and here it is, I finally go and face this boss, and I still end up getting on. And I'm like, man, I need to redo my strategy or something. I think that's the problem. I got you. Well, that's kind of what I encounter with this game. Now, I'm going to try to truck through it. I'm going to chalk it up to maybe, I- maybe my Xbox was just kind of acting up or something you know maybe i was encountering a lot of glitches that maybe people don't encounter because i was talking to another friend of mine and he said he didn't run into in any of these problems that i was explaining uh but anyways before this particular segment of the game i might have died maybe two times in the game playing at normal difficulty you know just average it's three difficulty settings of playing right in the middle right it's the one that's recommended for most players as they say um in this segment i probably died like nine or ten times easily and 
here's what happens. So they have like these um, these moments of the game. I think they're called like time splinters or something like that. If I remember right, I I'm, I'm, might be thinking off. But anyways, in this game, you have a time traveling mechanic um, where, you know, the story kind of goes into it. And whenever this whole time traveling thing happens, it kind of affects time. And it causes a fracture in time, which uh, gives your character abilities that you can use. But it also affects, like, the way things happen in the game, if you know what I mean. And there's also some player choice and whatnot. But anyways, you have these time splinters where you get into a certain area of the game and things will just kind of, like, happen in a pattern, kind of. Like, you'll see, um, you know, debris fall and then it'll go back up and so on. Like, it, you know, it's like time's in kind of like a loop in these areas. Well, previously the game teaches us various mechanics to deal with these elements of the game. You know, like uh, to use our powers in certain ways to deal with them. Yeah. And so, you know, there's this one segment where there's this like scaffolding that keeps falling down and going back up, you know. And I'm thinking, well, you know, the game has previously taught me to use this time stop mechanic to keep things from falling, you know. And so I was like, okay, I'll go ahead and cast that. So I cast it, go under, the scaffolding kills me anyways. I try it again, and it somehow magically works. So I think, well, maybe I was just a glitch, or I didn't cast it in the right spot or whatever. So I go into this next area that I'm supposed to go to, and I get hit, killed by a skilled girder. So I have to go back to the previous segment, you know, and the scaffolding happens again, and I get killed by again. So it turns out... Whatever happened the first and third time that didn't happen the second time where I survived and made it to the next scene, well, apparently I just, it was just a matter of timing. The time stop ability that the game previously taught me I could use doesn't actually work in that segment of the game. I just happened to make it out in time the second time I tried it as opposed to the first and third. So I was like, okay, well, I learned from that clearly. So let's go ahead and move on from there. So when I get to that part where I die by the steel girder, I watch the pattern. Okay, I say, okay, I see, you know, I see what's going on. And so I go through there, climb up on these, like, on the shipping container. And then there's a shipping container just to the left of me where something hits it and it collapses and then it goes back up and it goes through. So I say, well, clearly it's like the other mechanic. I'm supposed to go through the shipping container. I've got to wait until I have the right time and then I'll go through. Well, I probably died at this part like three times in a row, and then I decide, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and use the time stop thing, and th that doesn't work either. So I'm like, I'm just like kind of stumped. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Well, apparently, with the way they designed the level, I have to instead go a little bit to the right and climb up on this thing, which with the way the level is designed, it's not clear that I'm supposed to do that at all, you know? with the way that the level and the camera and everything is like. So okay, I figure that out, right? Yeah. And then I get into this other spot where I get stuck. There's like this box that I have to uh, climb on top of to get on top of a shipping container. So I get on top of the box just fine. But then when I try to use the jump button to climb, my guy keeps doing this stupid little wall kick thing, you know, like where he just kind of like kicks his foot a little bit off the wall and makes this like really sissy little hop. And I'm like, what am I doing wrong? You know, like, every other time I try to climb something in the game, it's just you hold forward and the jump button, which is A in this game, and you effortlessly, you know, you jump up, you reach your arms out, and you climb up just like you normally would in a game like this, you know, like a Tomb Raider game or something like that. Um, so, and for some reason, after several times trying to do this, I finally do climb up this shipping container. I'm like, okay, I, I, I can't even figure out what I'm doing different, you know, at this point, you know, because it, I never had any trouble with any other climbing segments of the game, just this one. And so I'm like, okay, whatever. And so I move on and then I get to this point where it looks like all I got to do is just run straight forward. Right. But yes. whenever I do that, I instantly get crushed by something off camera. And I'm like, what the hell? You know, what's going on here? So I get back to this spot and I notice, well, the ground is kind of like slightly fizzing a little bit, which the game does kind of introduce uh, that maybe stuff will fall. But whenever I got killed, I got crushed by something from above me. So I was like, that's kind of weird. 
So I decide, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and jump before I get there. And of course, that's magically what saves my character. So I slide down this debris, and I encounter these guys and got to fight them, right? So I kill a couple of guys, and then it's still Girder just randomly lands on my head. And I'm like, oh man, at this point, I'm just like frustrated, because it seems like every time I make progress, I just die on the next step. And, uh, I mean, I'm just kind of pissed off, you know, and then I, so I finally get back to that segment, kill those guys, then these time shifter dudes or whatever come out, where you got to kind of use, like, your powers, and they also have powers too, you know, so these are actually really interesting fights. And, um... That's the only time, like, I felt like I legitimately died at all was when I fight those guys. I died one time, you know, because that's those guys are actually kind of challenging to fight, you know, and they could flank you and stuff like that. So, you know, I get through that. But at this point, it's like, OK, you know, I died a crap load of times at this. I'm really frustrated. I was kind of talking to my friends and saying this is bullshit, you know, whatever. You know, I can see why this game's not getting good reviews. It, yeah. it just really sucks because, like, prior to this segment of the game, I was really enjoying it. You know, I was really getting into the character uh, that you play as, and the story was pretty interesting. You know, it has that nice sci-fi time-traveling mechanic, you know, that is timeless. You know, it's a story that is constantly visited by sci-fi authors because it is a really interesting mechanic, you know. Yeah. But... Uh, I don't know, man. I, I just feel like at this point, I'm just kind of like pushing through. I really hope that maybe I just ran into a bad part of the game and that I'm not going to really run into stuff like that, you know? The game teaches me to play this certain way, but then in this particular segment, it just kind of throws it out the window and wants you to do different things, mm-hmm. you know, which is not particularly a good game design. You know, it's not something I encountered in Alan Wake. You know, Alan Wake, it taught you the mechanics of that game, and it followed them fairly well, you know, like, what what you learn by playing through that game with using the flashlight. You gotta use the flashlight in order to damage enemies, you gotta stay in the light to recover your health, you know, it teaches you these kinds of mechanics, and it stays consistent with those, you know, it doesn't do anything that's kind of oddball like this does. Yeah. Yes. But uh, I mean, that's I'm not saying people should not play this game. May, like I said, maybe I just kind of ran to a fluke. Maybe I met Xbox was kind of glitching with some of the moments. Like I acknowledge like some of the deaths I had were probably because I just didn't pay attention to the patterns and whatnot initially, you know. But I don't know, some of them were just kind of bogus. And what's up with that climbing thing? Like why was my guy not climbing? <laughs> Apparently it had to be I think maybe one of the things they did, they might have actually rushed it out, probably, and they didn't really try to make sure that they had all their T's crossed and their I's dotted, if you will, for before they actually released the game. And maybe that's where some of the criticism came from other oh. reviewers. And well, I mean, the, the game was in development for six years, so... Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah. I mean, if it was rushed out, it must have been having a lot of trouble those first th- four or five years, and then they're like, "Oh shoot, Microsoft gave us a deadline. We better push through it." <laughs> yeah, know. that's also or, a lot of people also had mentioned the same thing about Final Fantasy 15. How some people didn't really like it because of because of the fact that uh, a lot of the side quests were like boring and the story really wasn't there, and mm-hmm. then they ended up going and taking the game and make it like a constant. Like, constantly be an updated game all the time with free updates and whatnot and uh you know it's like man this this game has been out for how long now and how long has it actually been in development and people talking about it and final fantasy versus 13 and all this other stuff and Mm -hmm. here it is here it is now it's final fantasy 15 and all that time spent and it seems like it was just kind of mediocre but that's just personally for me i mean i haven't actually finished the game just yet but everything that i've gone through thus far i think i've got my characters up to like level 36 or something like that one of my friends actually got them all the way up to like a, a level 101 or something like that he he just wanted to platinum the game but he didn't he didn't really enjoy his his time with it as much as uh, as other people have and i was kind of in the in the same camp because even i haven't finished it yet <laughs> i got you well it seemed like the enjoyment of overall is pretty uh, uh fair like i would love to play final fantasy 15 but i barely have touched it because partly because i don't really have the time to play huge games like that um but i did want to um have you talk about agents of mayhem a bit now this is a game that uh 
when I first saw it, I was just like completely underwhelmed. Which I know it sounds really weird because I like the developer Volition. I just don't like the publisher Deep Silver. They suck. Most of the <laughs> games they put out suck. And I was really disappointed that uh, Volition got bought out by them during the THQ, uh, you know, bankruptcy auction thingy, whatever. But, uh, you know, I was like, well, you know, it is Volition. I still want to give it a chance. And it seems like the game press as a whole, both um, the mainstream journalists as well as, like, YouTubers have been kind of lukewarm on this game. But I know you said you've enjoyed it. I mean, mm -hmm. or at least you have. I don't know if that's changed. Can you talk about your experience with uh, Agents of Mayhem? Yeah, um, actually, I had just completed the story mode probably, I think, maybe a week or so ago. And um, honestly, here's the thing for me that I've always thought about when I dealt with game. It's just the fact that if you see something that really does interest you, if you can get a hold of a demo, then try the demo. Like, for example, the Octopath, Octopath, that's funny. Octopath Traveler. Yeah, that's yeah. funny you mentioned demo because that rarely ever happens anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things that I really wish would come back. It's just like, for example, back in the day, like in, say, PlayStation Magazine, you get a demo disc of all these different playable demos. We need to have more demos come out nowadays, but that's a, that's a completely different subject altogether. But dealing back with the game itself, I actually had finished the story mode probably, I think, about a week or so ago. And the way that it ended, they just set it up for a sequel. It was a cliffhanger ending. Um, but besides that happening and the story kind of being just, eh, you know, some of the characters were actually pretty interesting, especially some of the one-liners and the humor and things that were in it and stuff like that. And the fact that you, when you, you can level up your agents as you go along, you can get these different abilities for them. Uh, the color, the, the world itself is, is really colorful, I think, and the action is really fast paced and each agent plays differently, honestly. And, um, the way that, uh, the open, the open world itself kind of seems like it's a bit empty. Uh, you you obviously have your normal tropes of open world games, you know, with different activities and things like you have your races and you have like kill this this many amount of enemies or, or liberate this area or, you know, something like that. I mean, there, there's a bunch of other different side activities for you to be able to do and costumes to find and skins to find and things like that. But um, overall, my whole time with it, I, I enjoyed it because of the fact of it just being like this fast paced colorful over the top third person shooter if you will and i still plan on going back again and going into the open world and completing some other activities and seeing if there might be some other trophies or something that i can get um but yeah overall i can i really understand why it's getting a lukewarm reception especially in some of the hideouts like the uh um i forgot exactly what the name of the main villains agency or something that you're going against i think it's called legion but i forgot what it stands for mm -hmm. and like you'll go inside there there'll be certain segments where you'll go inside these layers and these layers they kind of look all the same they have a few different paths but it kind of just looks like there was like this set amount of rooms that the developers had created and they just kind of mix matched them together for different layers and you're kind of going through the same ones and the same routines with like the same objectives um, but overall, the main thing was the gameplay that, that really just stuck with me. So I saw it through to the end, through the story, but sometime later on down the road when I just want to get in and just, you know, blast the hell out of some uh, robots or enemies or whatever and see their bodies ragged all out into the stratosphere, then I'll definitely jump back on it again. But, I mean, e even then, um, if some people can't really justify getting it at, say, $60, I would at least say get it at probably 30 or something, maybe half price, because even then I kind of feel like it's worth that, especially with the amount of gameplay that it can offer for you. Right, I got you. Does it have any multiplayer like the uh, Saints Row games at all? Sadly, no, it doesn't. And that was one of the main complaints, I think, that I've heard from people. They were like, this game is called Agents of Mayhem. And yeah, you have these different agents that you utilize, but why is it that you can't actually have a multiplayer aspect going on with the game? Now, I don't know if the developer ended up getting backlash about that. I mean, they probably did. I mean, it's the internet. What do you expect? Uh, they probably did get some backlash. And I don't know, maybe something could happen later on down the road where they might introduce some type of multiplayer deal. I'm not necessarily sure. Mm -hmm. But um, at, at press time, no, nah, there isn't anything in there. The only thing that they do have in there that 
it isn't even really multiplayer centered. It's the fact that you have these contracts that you can take out. And it's just like I mentioned before about some of the side activities, you know, kill a certain amount of enemies or get a certain amount of items or, or something like that. And you basically send these contracts out to either the, the, the public itself or just private with your own friends on your friends list. And you kind of complete them together and you can get cash rewards for them. You can get these cores that you use to, to level up and utilize in your different agents that gives them uh, a certain ability that, that really boosts them up in terms of like how they use their powers and whatnot. But that's as close as you can get to any type of multiplayer. Um, it's just you guys can kind of completing contracts together instead of actually gotcha. playing with one another. Because, I mean, the, the whole premise of the game, it seems like it's ripe for co-op gameplay. Because, like yeah. you said, the agents are playing differently, which mm -hmm. is a bit different from, like, say, playing Saints Row the Third or something like that, you know, where it's more like a cartoony Grand Theft Auto, like an outrageous Grand Theft Auto, where, you know, the characters play very similarly, but, you know, this still has, like, those opportunities for multiplayer and co-op. Whereas this game, where it seems like it would benefit a lot more from that, and it does not have it, but it is still pretty interesting to see that it has some kind of online connectivity like that. You know, that's something that uh, a lot of companies should consider, even if they don't think multiplayer is right for their game. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, that being said, um, I really enjoy the Saints Row games. From what I've seen of this game, it's probably something I would wait on, because just because it doesn't seem like it's up to the same level of quality, which I don't know if that's really a lot to do with Volition. I think it's more to do with Deep Silver. I I, I doubt you. I doubt you that they have granted as much of a budget on developing the game as they did with like say THQ. THQ was infamous for wasting money, <laughs> and. Uh, but the good thing is, though, their developers, they had enough money to, like, really pour into these games. And Deep Silver is kind of the opposite, you know. They're a lot more conservative with their money, which is partly why they're still around, unlike THQ. <laughs> but the downside, of course, with that is the games are going to typically be more bare bones, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Which, yeah. I mean, yeah, there was Saints Row 4, but come on, that game was practically developed by uh, while they were under THQ. And basically, Deep Silver only picked it up at the uh, last few months of development. Mm -hmm. But anyways, um, so that and then hell, Saints Row Four wasn't even supposed to be its own game. It was originally supposed to be a DLC expansion for three. From what I understand. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I heard. And another thing is, it was actually supposed to be taking place after a certain ending and get out of hell but i've heard that that really isn't that important but yeah i'm like well if it wasn't if it's not important then i guess i really don't have to finish get out of hell even though i have it <laughs> oh you're talking about agents of mayhem yeah exactly agents right. of mayhem is, is supposed to be it's supposed to have it goes off an ending or something to happen after get out of hell from from what i've uh, from what i've heard well, that's really weird why they would drop the Saints Row name if it's in the same universe, and that's that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, they just call it Saints Row Agents of Mayhem, huh? it's something like that. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's just called Agents of Mayhem. That's what it says on yeah. the box and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's kind of weird that they would drop that, because, I mean, that's, and that's, that's, like I said, it's another deep silver thing. Like, I don't understand how they're still around, because, like, that just seems so obvious. It's in the Saints Row universe. Attached to Saints Row name, that would sell more copies because somebody that maybe liked the Saints Row game but has never heard of this game, they see it at their local Target or something. Like that. Oh, Saints Row, Agents of Mayhem. I didn't know they had a new Saints Row game. Sure, I'll buy that. But now mm -hmm. they'll just see Agents of Mayhem and they'll just probably ignore it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. It's, it's just like, um, it's just like, uh, dang, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Yeah. But never mind, it wasn't important. Maybe I'll just, oh, I remember what it was now. It, it's really funny because I think one of the things is they were really trying to make it its own franchise because they were trying to make it feel like basically an adult version of G.I. Joe, like a, a Saturday morning cartoons, because the cutscenes are actually 2D animated, like something you would probably see on uh, G.I. Joe or something I, like I that. I did see the animated, some of the animated cutscenes. That is a really cool part. I like that touch for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyways, um, I've been playing some retro too you know i haven't just been playing quantum break so i've been playing a game called magic of shahrazad i don't know if that's how you pronounce it it's a really weird 
but unique game that came out on the NES. Have you ever heard of this game? No, but now that you mention that last name, I think that's actually one of the Agents of Mayhem name. As a matter of fact, she's like this ninja type of chick, and I think that's the exact same name that she had. <laughs> okay, well, it's spelled S-C-H-E-H-E-R-A-Z-A-D-E. Uh, I think that's probably it, or it might be close enough. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, which it's actually um, it's actually an old school name. This is actually uh, a character from like Persian lore. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of like some of the Persian stories, like Aladdin and so on, actually refer to this person. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyways, in this game, it's it, it's a Zelda clone essentially. Okay. <laughs> You know, Legend of Zelda, huge game back then, in case you didn't notice. So obviously, oh, yeah. some developers were going to kind of do their own take on that. And that's what this company called Culture Brain did. Uh, they made this game Magic of Scheherazade. But unlike most Zelda clones, this game is just nuts. It's like bonkers with how it plays, man. Uh, so first of all, you have your typical open world exploring like in the legend of zelda where you go screen to screen you know when you go one screen it goes to the next screen you have your sword attacking and whatnot in the in this where you attack the enemies right pretty mm -hmm. pretty basic stuff it throws a lot of curveballs for one there's segments in the game where it just randomly throws you into a random turn-based RPG battle for no reason at all. It just you go into a screen and it has like a random chance that you'll run into this RPG battle, which is completely wild that a game like that would have such a mechanic, especially back then. You know, like I mean, games often did have their moments where they would have like a couple different modes of play. Like I'm sure you remember Bayou Billy, right? Oh yeah, had, I actually played it back in the day. Where you, you had like the beat em up stage, and then you have like the light gun stage, and then you have the jeep stage, and it kind of like alternates between those. But there wasn't really games like this where it would have multiple modes of play, and it could just like, at a whim, just change. You know what I mean? It's not like, whereas those games, like, it'll change from level to level. Like, it has like clearly defined objectives. Uh, for this, but this game completely throws that out, out the door by introducing these turn-based battles. And so, you know, you're walking around the overworld swinging your sword, or you can shoot a magic rod, too. That's another thing that Zelda uh, does have. It does have a magic rod, right? But in this game, it's one of your methods of attack. And then you just get into this turn-based battle where you select party members to fight these enemies, and... You also can hire troops, which are kind of like AI players that just randomly attack enemies. And they get hit by an enemy and they die. But you can hire these troops to kind of help bolster your numbers in combat and increase their damage and the amount of attacks and whatever. Which is really neat. I've never seen such a mechanic back then and I faintly can even name anything nowadays that has such a mechanic. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um... And then, this game also has time traveling. Hmm. Everybody knows Chrono Trigger has time traveling. This game well, beat it. Games ever. This game beat it by if we go by the Japanese release date, uh, like eight years, because <laughs> <laughs> it came out like back in 1987. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you have to uh, open these time doors in order to go back or forward in time. And, of course, like in Chrono Trigger, the map will change and, you know, things like that. But it's just wild to think that a game so far before that was kind of experimenting with this idea and, um, you know, doing various things like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, then, and then the shops, the shops even have something unique to this game that I can't ever recall seeing in most games i mean most games you go to a shop you go to buy or sell right you know you buy stuff you sell stuff pretty self-explanatory well this game doesn't have any selling of stuff but you go to buy stuff right 
and the shopkeeper will say it's this much. It gives you the option to request a discount on the item, which is just insane, you know, like, you can actually ask the shopkeep for a discount. And depend depending on the item and whatever, sometimes he'll actually give you the discount and he'll lower the price. And on occasion, on, on a couple of items, I noticed you can even request a discount again and he'll lower it even further. But if you request a discount on an item that's not discountable, he'll take some money from you and throw you out of the shop. <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah. So you, but 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 it's it's not randomized or anything like that. Like once you figure out which items he'll discount, which ones he won't, you know which ones to ask the discount for versus the ones where just go ahead and buy if you want it, you know. But that's just still a really interesting mechanic to see in a game, you know. And uh, there's just a lot of little things like that in this game that it introduces. I'm probably about halfway through it now. Uh, that's another weird thing about this game versus others. Like Zelda, you know, like I said, you have an open world. You explore the open world, that's the whole game, right? This game is actually split into chapters. So you have one open world, then you go to chapter two, you have another open world. Chapter three, you have another open world. So there's actually multiple worlds you can explore this game. So it's it's a huge game, you know. Uh, I've been playing probably about roughly 10 hours, I'd say, so far. And like I said, I'm only about halfway through the game. And last time I played the original Legend of Zelda on the NES, I think it took me maybe like four to five hours to beat. Ugh. So it's a pretty lengthy game. Now, this is the first time I'm actually trying to beat this game. I don't really have as much experience as I did with Zelda, but still, it's it's definitely a beefier game in terms of content. And uh, yeah, it's a really it's a really fun game, but it does have like really strange mechanics like this, you know, that sometimes it works better than others. Like, like I said, it has that turn based RPG mechanic. It's a really mind-blowing idea, but once you get enough money, you can hire a whole bunch of troops, and it just makes it significantly easy. And then it's like, well, you don't really need to mess with them, especially since the game has weird soft level caps. Like, in each world, you can only get to a certain level of experience. And then once you get to that level, you don't rack up any more experience until you get to the next chapter. So it's kind of pointless to fight enemies at that point unless you need the extra money to buy equipment or, you know, stuff like that. Because, well, you can't, you know, you're not going to get any experience. What's the point in fighting him, right, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. That especially holds true for the uh, random battles, which another element the random battles have is you can actually bribe enemies to stop the fight, which... I understand Shin Megami Tensei way back in the day did similar mechanics with the fights... So I'm not going to give this game too much credit there, but that's still pretty interesting compared to at least games that came out in the States didn't have anything else like that. Uh, and then another thing that I thought was really interesting with this game is, well, the translation. I mean, you've seen bad game translations, <laughs> I'm sure. Oh yeah, especially in like Final Fantasy VII, for example, yeah. where Ares, Ares or Ares was like, "This guy are sick." <laughs> Dude, this game's translation is terrible. I mean, it's legendarily bad, even by NES standards. Uh. It's amazing that the NPCs that you talk to actually give you useful information so that you can progress in the game, uh. because they don't make much sense otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> or they, or, or, or you understand what they're saying, but what they're saying is completely broken. Uh, oh, and I actually tweeted out a really fun little tidbit uh, from this game. I took a screen capture of something because it reminded me of Game of Thrones. So let me find if see if I can find that screen capture real quick. Oh, here it is. I put a little Game of Thrones foreshadowing, Magic of Shahrazad. Sher and one of the NPCs said. I heard the season called Winter is coming. <laughs> oh, I got totally goodness. got a crack out of that, you know, but uh, <laughs> this game even predicted Game of Thrones. So fantastic. But uh, I mean, it, it's a really interesting game and it has its moments. But like I said, it doesn't like completely gel together. Like there is, like I said, it's got a really bad translation. Some of the elements that they mix don't make a lot of sense. Um, it has a really neat mechanic where on the game it'll tell you the B and A buttons what they'll do. 
and you can actually pause to switch out the abilities that you use with the B and A buttons. Like it doesn't have like a thing like Zelda where you just choose like your items or whatever. You actually choose the abilities that you want to use, like your spells and um, speaking and jumping and using your sword and things like that. You actually choose the abilities on that menu. But there's moments in the game where you have to constantly switch back and forth between these moments. And it that just gets really annoying too, you know, but it's a pretty decent game. It's not as good as Willow, not as good as Crystallis, but if you want a Zelda clone that kind of like throws it all out the door and just does what it does and is completely unique, it's a good game to check out. Mm. So, you know, I, I'd say it's like a good seven, maybe six and a half, seven. Mm. You know, it's pretty good, but it does have a lot of flaws too. So that's what I've been playing, you know. Uh, I kind of talked about that a little bit more, I guess, because I've been playing a lot more. I've, I've got a lot more time in it than Quantum Break. I've only got maybe three hours in the Quantum Break right now. Mm. Yeah, I've uh, I've been jumping around, like I mentioned before, for a few other different things. I haven't really been sticking a whole lot with something. As a matter of fact, I've really been trying to see if I could finish Yakuza 0 so I could finally play Yakuza's Kiwami because I got that, and that's just been gathering dust until I finish 0. I mean... I was like, oh my gosh! I'm glad it was actually budget price though, so I don't feel like I don't feel like I had buyer's remorse or anything for uh, it. But, I got gotcha. you. Uh, yeah. Plus, you probably got the steel book, didn't you? The steel book for Kiwami. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah, very I nice. Was like, yeah, it was. I was like, oh, what's this? I was like, I didn't know this one had a steel book. So, yeah, I went ahead and uh, yeah, it was thirty bucks. It wasn't full price of sixty. And I think maybe the reason they did that was because of the fact that they all they already released Yakuza Zero this year, so they were like, yeah, we're gonna we're not gonna charge a full price for this, considering it's basically a remake of the very first game. So, right. Um, I I need to pick up Yakuza Zero. I still haven't, but I did pick up Yakuza Kiwami, and I'm probably gonna get started on that. I hope within a month. But I also have a save in Yakuza 4 on the PS3 that I really need to get through. I'm more than halfway through that game. But anybody that's listening to the podcast, if you like beat em up type games at all, just freaking play Yakuza already. <laughs> just do it. I mean, if you're stuck on Xbox, I understand, okay? You have an excuse because you can't play the games on Xbox. And same with Nintendo systems. But if you have a PS3 or PS4, just get a freaking Yakuza game and start playing, man. They're great. Mm. They really yeah, are absolutely. great. Yeah, um, I, haven't, I haven't really put too much time into some of the other Yakuza games, but Zero's been the main one that I put a lot of time in. And I also ended up trying out Dead Souls or something, I believe it's called. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people had some qualms with that, but I was like, well, I just had this for about $4. And I was like, right. this seems pretty good to me for that price. I mean, pretty much everybody I've talked to that started with Yakuza Zero has just said it's an amazing game. And mm. uh, I already knew it would be really good, but at the time I just didn't have the money to get it because I was actually mo I moved I was moving into a new house at the time I have completed that move now I hope to get the game eventually but I'm just waiting for the price to come down a little bit because it's still a pretty pricey game but for good reason because it's a good game and pe the people that are trading in it's not that common that people trade it in you know what I mean so yeah. the use prices are still pretty high too but I do want to support the developer you know, I want to bring more Yakuza games over. So I'm going to buy it new when I do eventually buy it. I'm just kind of hoping for it to drop down to like 40 bucks or, you know, something like that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. When that time comes. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into some gaming news. Um, I think we had a really productive conversation with what we've been playing and whatnot. But I do want to get into some of the topics that we were going to cover today. So uh, first of all, I wanted to just touch real briefly on a segment, um, the developer of Oceanhorn, which is another Zelda clone. <laughs> Seems like Zelda yeah. clones are the theme of the episode so far. Um, mm -hmm. It's a, a game called Oceanhorn Monster of the Uncharted Seas or something like that. And mm -hmm. in terms of style, it looks like a Pixar-ized version of Wind Waker. It's the best way I can put it, you know, because it's not cell shaded, but it still has that look. 
and it almost has like a Pixar look to the uh, the graphics. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but the game plays a bit differently, of course. You know, it's more of a overhead type game. It's not in third person. It's not a huge sweeping epic game like Zelda is, but it does have a lot of similarities at the same time. Well, this game came out for various platforms. You know, we have it available on the PC. We have it on the PS4. I think the Xbox One has it. You can get it on iPhone. All kinds of stuff, right? So right. this game is available on a lot of different platforms. But what's really interesting about this is that it recently came out for the Nintendo Switch. Okay? Yeah. So it only came out on Nintendo Switch a couple of months ago, back in June. And they've already announced, the developer of the game had tweeted out, and this is according to them, we don't have any other news source that go by, digital sales are really hard to find news on and whatnot. But according to the developer, the Nintendo Switch version of Oceanhorn has sold more than every other version of the game combined. Which is just insane. Because this game, like I said, it's out on the PS4. It's out on Steam. It's out on Xbox One. They even have it on the Wii U. So it's not like the Nintendo audience didn't know this game existed. Because it was out on the Wii U. And iPhone. And it's outsold all of those combined. Which is just <laughs> insane. Especially considering that the Switch version just came out a couple months ago. These other uh -huh. systems have had, like, a huge head start on it. So, I'm really... I'm just kind of flabbergasted. Why is it selling so much better on the Switch? <laughs> I think it really... I think it kind of boils down to a lot of people... Well, it's like we already mentioned before about it being a Zelda clone. And I think another thing it boils down to is... A lot of people, at least it seems like nowadays, I mean, obviously you have the console Zeldas as well, but I mm -hmm. guess also a lot of people really associate Zelda with handheld and yep. looking looking at it from a certain perspective, it almost looks like a link between worlds, but set in the Wind Waker universe, if you will, kind of, sort of. Right. And um, I have the game on PS4. I actually did a stream of it, as a matter of fact, on my channel as well. I have it on PS4. I haven't completed it or anything like that, but... A funny thing is the second one that's in development kind of looks like Skyward Sword. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that they, yeah. they've changed the perspective. It looks like they're going a little more of an adventure kind of game with that one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, which I, I'm sure with the first game, obviously the budget probably wasn't as big and all this good stuff. You know, I'm sure the development team's bigger. They can probably do more grandiose things now. But, okay, mm. I have a couple of counter arguments. First of all, the PS4 has sold over 60 million systems. The Switch is Hallelujah. sitting... The yes. Switch is only... I mean, the Switch has been selling great, but at least yeah. according to the numbers we have so far, it's sitting at around 6 million. Mm. So the PS4 has a 10 times system advantage, and that's not counting the hundreds of millions of iPhones and gaming PCs and everything else that's out there too, right? Yeah. So... It's just really weird. And then, of course, like you mentioned, the whole Zelda thing. Well, a counter-argument to that is, well, you can play Zelda um, Breath of the Wild on the Switch. Why do you need another Zelda kind of game? Whereas on PS4, your options are a bit more limited. On Xbox One, I can't think of hardly any games that play like Zelda. So it seems like a game like this would gravitate towards it. So, I mean, do you think it's simply a matter of the audience that has the systems and that maybe the audience is just a lot more prone to Zelda kind of games. And that's why they're buying it on the switch. Um, and you mentioned the handheld thing. Well, then why is it not selling that great on the iPhone? You think maybe the controls like, Oh, it's just touch screens. Like, you know, obviously in, yeah, I can't stand touch screens. I made a rant about that too. Yeah, <laughs> I made a rant about touch screens on my channel. I just I couldn't take it anymore. I, I really you. don't know, honestly. I'm not necessarily sure why it is that it would be selling so much on the Switch. I think another reason is obviously, yeah, the PS4 is going to end up uh, have selling more than than the Switch because the the Switch is a is a newer system. But then again, at the same time, um, I guess another thing is when the Switch came out, a lot of people were really wanting to have. 
Uh, obviously, more games come out on the Switch, and maybe this was one of them that just really caught people's eye, and they're like, okay, I really do need to get this. I would love to be able to not only play this at home, but then take it home, uh, you know, out with me and play it out at a restaurant or something, or at a ball game, or, you know, or whatever the case may be, and I, I guess it's probably just one of those games that people really gravitate towards, like, you could do it at home, or you could do it on the go, and, and uh, you know, I get, that, that's that's my thought on it, anyways. Right. I, I can't really get into it. You know, that guys. makes that probably makes the most sense because, like I said, this is an indie game. I'm sure they probably don't do a lot of marketing for this kind of game, and so store exposure is everything. You know, you can't get the game physically, so people. Well, you, you can technically. There is the limited run release, but that's another story entirely. No, yeah, that's another story entirely. <laughs> uh, but uh, you, you can't just go into GameStop or Walmart or something like that and pick this game up off the shelf. So people don't have exposure that way. On the things I mentioned, like PS4, iPhone. Well, those platforms, like the iPhone, there's over a million apps. Unless you knew to look for this game, you're probably not going to stumble upon it. And then PS4 is a similar situation. Not nearly as many apps, but... There's still thousands of games available that you can download on the PS4. Mm -hmm. So again, you have to know what you're looking for, or it has to be a game similar to something you're already looking at to even know it's there, right? Yeah. Xbox is probably a similar situation. Now the Wii U, okay, the Wii U probably doesn't have as big of a digital marketplace. You know, mm -hmm. Steam's the same as the PS4 and Xbox One. Huge marketplace. It's really hard to discover games there. So Wii U, what's the situation with that? Why did it not sell on the Wii U? Well, the Wii U had an issue with digital distribution. I think a lot of people, like myself included, I didn't pay for anything digitally on the Wii U. You know, because with the way Nintendo was doing digital distribution during the time, it was all tied to the console. So if something happened to my console, yeah, there is technically a way where you can contact them to get it, but it's a pain in the butt. And it's a lot of effort, and everything is on you to get that game back. The other platforms don't work like that. You just sign into your account, boom, just re-download it. You know, it's no big deal. Um, I think people kind of realize that. Plus, the Wii U had more limited storage, especially if you had the 8-gig model, and you download the required patch that's 5.5 gigs. So you have, like, 2 gigs left. <laughs> so, so yeah, you're not going to download a lot of games with two gigs. You know, you're using that storage very carefully, especially if you want to download DLC for Mario Kart 8 or something like that. So, but the Wii or the Switch, yes, it still has a limited amount of storage, but the expandable storage is very inexpensive. You don't have huge patches that eat up into that storage. You know, it does have, you do have patches, but they don't eat nearly as much of that storage. So you have a lot more room to download the games. Plus the marketplace is a lot smaller. There's only like, I don't think there's even 100 games on the on the Switch right now. I think it's like in the 80 range if you add up everything that you can download right now. So it's a lot easier to find a game like this on the market. So I think that's, that's why it's been selling better. Is because it's had the right audience already baked into the system Plus, since there's not a lot of market competition, it stands out a lot better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my theory anyways. But uh, let's go ahead and move on to some more Nintendo really stuff. This is pretty much in the whole Nintendo story thing. I kind of hate doing that because I like to kind of split things up, talk about some PlayStation stuff, some Xbox stuff, some PC stuff. But unfortunately, we only really have like one gaming related news story that covers anything that's not Nintendo. It's just because uh -huh. Nintendo has been doing a lot of new stuff. Well, this one is Nintendo related, but it's not Nintendo. Although they're probably going to shut it down any day. Now there is a multiplayer mod available for the Nintendo 64 version of super Mario 64 that allows you to play with up to 23 other people. And it also introduces characters like Waluigi into the game. This is just crazy. Have you seen this multiplayer mod? No, I haven't heard of it at all, honestly. 
Dude, it is, uh, just look for, like, Super Mario 64 multiplayer, I mean, it, on YouTube. It's insane, um, the, the craziness with this. And you can play as Princess Peach, and you can play as Wario, and, uh, Luigi, and Toad, and it's just so crazy, you know? Like, why? Why is there a multiplayer mod for Mario 64? That's one thing that kind of gets me. A lot of people go and they they praise mods and things like that, which, you know, I'm all for. I'm all about trying to extend a game's life, for sure. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, some some it just seems like some of these things are just like experiments and things that they do, and they're seeing probably trying to see how far they can actually take the technology or they want to try to do what they can with it just to see if they can break it or something. I, I don't know. It, it just it kind of it comes to mind. I'm like... You know, especially when you're doing it with a Nintendo property, like you mentioned before, Nintendo's probably going to shut it down when they get word of it, which they probably already have. But at the same time, it's just like, man, some people just come up with some of the strangest things to be able to put into mm -hmm. a game that gets some, that gets such a large amount of attention. Like some, like say for example, some really weird mods and say Skyrim or Fallout 4 or something like that. It's just, it's so, some of them just get so much attention, but they're just the strangest things. And I guess that's kind of one of the one of these these things in a way in a way when mario 64 came out it kind of had somewhat of an open worldish aspect to it at least in that point in time and i mean yeah you had your loading screens and whatnot when you were going to different areas but i really don't know i'll have to look up some video footage of this because i've honestly never heard of this until now yeah now if i remember right i know super mario 64 ds you can play as multiple characters like you had Wario and Luigi and uh, Yoshi that you could play as in that, but mm -hmm. I don't think that that had multiplayer, did it? Um, oh, it did. No, oh, it did. Oh, yeah. did it? Yeah, apparently okay. it did have a multiplayer. I guess. Um, I guess it's not like what we would expect as multiplayer out of it, though. I guess it worked differently. So that, that's kind of weird, but. But yeah, I guess that's really interesting still. But this is like the actual legit Mario 64, where you can play with up to 23 other people. Exactly. And uh, that's really, that's actually so chaotic, you know? <laughs> yeah, it seems like it would be. It seems like a lot of people would be jumping on each like, other. Like, like, like would, everybody, would everybody have their own camera? Or is it like one camera and, every, and you have the 24 players running around in that zone? That's That would be chaotic. Yeah, that would be crazy. Uh, I guess you could say maybe if you do it in certain areas of the game, you can kind of have like a weird semi-impromptu Smash Brothers in 3D kind of thing yeah, going on. But... Yeah, that's, yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's the idea behind this, but uh, that's still really interesting. Um, but let's talk about some things that are not interesting. Now it's time to take a break for everything that people wanted to talk about, and let's talk about the news nobody cares about! This is the news that nobody cares about, because somebody's got to report it, and might as well be me. So anyways, from what I've been hearing, there have been copies of Mass Effect Andromeda floating around at your local Goodwill. Uh, I'm not sure if this is even a confirmed story, this just been hearing reports on NeoGAF, about people claiming that they've been finding brand new sealed copies of Mass Effect Andromeda at their Goodwill. Uh, some people wow. are speculating that uh, maybe EA is just trying to offload some copies. Maybe they're doing this as a charitable donation, as a tax write-off, so that they could just kind of be rid of this game. I mean, has it really been selling that bad? I guess so, <laughs> if it's the case. But uh, I, I just find it, I just find it hilarious. It's like, well, duh, if you rush a game... And you release it as a buggy mess, yeah, people aren't gonna buy it. And then you gotta do things like this. EA should have just held on to this game for a few more months, let them tweak it a bit, then mm -hmm. release it. 
Yeah, honestly, I kind of feel the same way. Honestly, I mean, I, I did end up getting Mass Effect Andromeda, and to be quite honest, personally, from my experience, I did actually enjoy the game. I got through the entire game without having to worry about any problems or anything. I did run into a few bugs and glitches, but nothing that broke the game. I, I finished it, went from beginning to end, and I do actually plan on go, going back and doing another playthrough and making other story decisions and whatnot. But I agree with you. I really do think that if they probably ended up pushing this game, I believe until the end of the year or maybe early next year or the middle of next year something along those lines it probably would have had a much better uh, might have gotten a much better reaction from people and fans and whatnot and maybe the mass effect series as we know it at least from what we've heard right now wouldn't be dying as it was because from what i last heard bioware seems like they're pretty much putting the bioware of uh, the bioware they're pretty much putting the mass effect series on the shelf right now because of just the underwhelming reaction that has come from mass effect andromeda which, I mean, we can't completely blame Bioware. Like I said, there is that uh, Bioware Montreal or whatever was who actually was developing the game, not the main branch of Bioware, right? And uh, like I said, the game obviously was released in a state that it should not have been. Now, that's not to say it's a bad game necessarily. Like you said, you enjoyed the game despite the bugs and whatnot. I'm sure it could be plenty enjoyable for people, but it is a major AAA big budget game and so I can understand if somebody pays $60 or more for such a game that they expect a experience that reflects that you know sure. bugs and glitches are probably not going to bother people as much if it's an indie game or something like that if you know what I mean so, uh, yeah, yeah, because they would have been, they'd be expecting, well, then again, I'm not really sure. It seems like a lot of people nowadays are really expecting a lot out of out of any developers knowing how large, uh, uh, how popular and um, large indie developers have been getting lately. And a lot of people have, they, they, they might actually be putting any developers on the same mark as they would AAA developers now because they've been growing and the quality of, of so many titles have actually been getting better over time. Um, but yeah, you're right. When, when it deals with dealing with a huge triple-a title it's like hey you guys have a whole lot more money than these other guys do the the indie guys and it seems like some of the indie guys will be putting out more uh technically sound titles than you guys are and you guys have these millions of dollars and, and all these and all these developers and people working on this game and you end up releasing it in such a state it's like are you kidding me <laughs> oh yeah for sure and so, in other news the Nintendo Switch is getting in on the MOBA craze. I mean, everybody loves MOBAs like League of Legends and Dota 2. I kind of say that with sarcasm, of course. But there are a lot of people yeah. that play these games. And so if you've got Nintendo Switch and you like MOBA games, don't worry. You're going to get a MOBA. There is a game called Arena of Valor coming out to the Nintendo Switch. Now, it's technically a mobile phone game put out by a company called Tencent, which is a Chinese company that puts out a bunch of crappy pay-to-win games. But, hey, <laughs> Nintendo Switch is getting a MOBA, so I don't care about it, but maybe you do. <laughs> Yeah, and, I don't really care about MOBAs myself, honestly. I've kind of looked into them a bit, but yeah, I never really bothered with them. Although there was one that kind of did pique my interest at one point a few years ago, and that was Lord of the Rings, considering I'm a Lord of the Rings fan. I was like, yeah, I really want to check this out. But then when I started to realize it was basically just a MOBA, I'm like, yeah, you know, I didn't really bother with it. Yeah, I totally gotcha. But you know what? If you're not into Lord of the Rings, you can now play Minecraft for your new Nintendo 3DS. So you can now get Minecraft for yet another platform in case you are tired of playing it on your Xbox 360, Xbox One, PS3, PS4, PS Vita, Wii U, Switch, iPhone, Android, and I'm sure I probably missed one or two. It's been out of everything else, essentially. So, uh, oh, the Vita, the, the, the PlayStation Vita, I forgot about that one. Who doesn't yeah, it's like, it's like I'm, t I'm tired of all those other platforms. I want to play the exact same game once again on a brand new platform because, damn it, I'm just going to go out there and just throw my money around around everywhere because it just doesn't matter anymore for buying the same game yeah. as across a billion different other consoles. Yeah, and by the way, that is just for the new Nintendo 3DS. The regular 3DS will not play this game. Mm. Um, and if you happen to be a Ghost Recon fan, well, guess what? Ghost Recon Wildlands is getting PvP. You know that game that you bought for co-op? Yes, you can shoot each other now. <laughs> nice, I have the game. I definitely need to check that out. I didn't know that. Oh, okay, you actually care about it. 
<laughs> well, I, 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 I'm not really. The thing, when it comes to me, a multiplayer, I'm not really a multiplayer kind of guy unless it's like in an MMORPG aspect, you know, actually going in dungeons and leveling up and stuff like that. Other than that, I'm not really a multiplayer kind of guy. But seeing that this has happened, I got a few friends of mine that have the game as well. So maybe I'll hook up with them and be like, hey, let's go shoot each other in the face. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, there's already millions of games you could do that. But, yeah, hey, yeah, exactly. <laughs> if it's the only one you own, then do it. You know, I guess. Yeah. Uh, even though you bought the game for completely other reasons besides that, but anyways. That, that uh, <laughs> so the last thing is, if you happen to have Star Wars Battlefront on PC, well, guess what? You need to get on Origin and download the Season Pass for free right now. If mm -hmm. you even care about the game anymore, because Star Wars Battlefront 2 is about to come out. Mm. Yeah, maybe you guys should have made it free on console, too. Just saying, like, that's probably the only people that still be playing this game, I imagine, is those that are on console. Yeah, I, w I, w I would definitely say so. Because, I mean, on PC, um, uh, on PC, shit. I'm sure you can probably play the actual Star Wars Battlefront 2 uh, still to this day online. So, uh, mm -hmm. I imagine you'd probably just be doing that if you had a PC to game on. Yeah, that's true. That That's, uh... That's kind of shitty, especially when it seems like a lot of people ended up putting a whole lot of uh, money and yeah. time and whatnot into the previous season pass, and here mm -hmm. it is now. This is happening. This is one reason why I do not bother with season passes. I never have, and I honestly never will. Well, I totally get their reason behind it is because, um, you know, the, the player bases die off. But it's going to yeah. die off anyway because of the new game coming out. So you should have did this sooner if you were going to do it at all, you know? Yeah, that's true. So that's the news that nobody cares about, because nobody cares about it, but I had to cover it so that you guys would know about it, even though you don't care about it. So let's go ahead and get back to some real news. Uh, so we've got the Nintendo Classic. Everybody knows about the craze of this thing, how hard it was to get. This thing was impossible to get, pretty much, for some people. Despite that, Nintendo said that they claimed that they sold over 2 million of these things still. Even though, where's the evidence? We haven't been seeing them in stores, right? Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. Nintendo has gave us a reassurance because we've got the Super Nintendo Classic coming out this month on the 29th as of this recording, September 13th. So it's coming out in just a couple of weeks and they are going to be having the Super Nintendo Classic and Nintendo has claimed that they're going to have more units of that available at launch than they sold through all of last year for the NES Classic, which I'm calling bullshit on that. But Nintendo also announced that they're bringing back the NES Classic next summer in 2018, which is really interesting. What do you think about that? Well, first of all, with the NES Classic coming back, I say I will believe it when I see it. <laughs> because, or either that or it's just going to be a scalper's paradise once again. But the fact is, is that all of the whole kerfluffle that was going on with the NES Classic and all of that, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, I'll believe it when I see it with the SNES Classic once again, because uh, say Walmart, for example, they have problems with their pre-orders, and I think some other places have problems with pre-orders as well, dealing with the SNES Classic. But I will say, for one thing, with, the, with, with my experience with getting uh, an NES Classic, I honestly thought that I never would. I ended up going to a local Walmart to check everything out, to ask them about it. I would go like every few days or so if I was going to get groceries or something or whatever, and they never had them. There was one day that I went there, and I told myself, you know what, I'm going to go and check it out and see if they have one the electronic section because I almost told myself I wasn't going to bother. And when I went there, they had one left. And I said, okay, I want this right now. I ended up having my buggy with me. I parked it right up next to where the glass case was to block it from anybody else seeing it. And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I actually went to go uh, tell, tell uh, one of the girls that was working there. She's actually a friend of mine too i told her about it and she's like oh man she's like i wish we had some more so that i could end up picking one up and i went ahead and, and got it and, and bought it home, brought it home and played a good bit of it and i had to get one of those extension cables that you put onto the controller because the controller itself is just is short as piss so Which I, uh, I just don't understand why they're so short i have an original <laughs> nintendo with several controllers yeah. all of those controller cables are like anywhere between six to ten foot long it just depends on 
if you got an original Nintendo controller or an aftermarket and so on, but they're much longer. And this was back when this was back when we we're gaming on like thirteen to nineteen inch TVs, so we had to sit a lot closer to see what's going on. And now, I think that was probably one of the things they were trying to do. They were trying to make you be able to mimic what it was like to sit on the floor once again and play Nintendo. <laughs> yeah. No, you Yeah, exactly. You had to have a really long HDMI cable, perhaps. Yeah. To oh, look yeah. up to it. But uh but yeah, I, I happened to get mine at launch. I sat in line for a few hours to get mine. Because I knew no one Nintendo, it was probably gonna be a craze. I didn't think it was going to be as big of a craze as it was. I didn't think it was going to be a short supply as it ended up being. You know, I thought Nintendo was going to be like doing this initial short supply thing and then Black Friday rolls around and boom, huge rush of units. So we build up all this hype and now we've got these units to sell to you. But no, they weren't there at Black Friday. So, uh, but yeah, anyways, just craziness. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with you, man. I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? The fact that they announced it, it does have one good effect with this. It probably will affect scalper prices for a while. Because mm-hmm. people know, now that Nintendo said that they're going to bring it back next year, it's now a matter of, do I want to go ahead and pay $250 to this scalper now so I can get it now? Or Hell do no. <laughs> I want to just bypass it and get, like, a Raspberry Pi or do something else entirely? Or do I just want to wait until next year? You know? So now there's that other choice, which ultimately affects the ability of the scalper to control the market. Mm. So um, so I, I, I predict that prices will come down a bit on the NES Classic because of this. Because... They're, the people that are patient enough, they're not going to be as willing to buy it now. So you only mm-hmm. have the total idiots that are going to be buying it now. And yeah, the scalpers are still going to get some bank, but it's not going to be as bad, I don't think. I think the prices will come down because of this. So that's one good thing about this. Even if Nintendo's completely lying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that could be the case. They could just be saying that, trying to actually get people's uh, dandruff up, if you will, for them to be able to be like, oh, Nintendo, you're just lying. You're not going to end up putting out more consoles. And there may be a chance that they, they, they could actually end up doing that. We'll just have to, to wait and see. If that be the case, then, uh, I mean, because there's no chance, no chance in hell that I would ever end up giving a scalper any of my money to be able to get one of those things. I'm either going to pay what the price is that Nintendo is asking, which is $80, which I understand why they would be pricing it at 80 instead of it just being uh, the usual 60 for the NES Classic, I guess because it was it's like another jump in technology, you know, because it's going to their next console, if you will, like it was back in the 90s. I, I think two reasons. One, it does have a second controller now. Oh, that's good. And the other reason, I'm pretty sure, is because of the inclusion of Star Fox 2. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think I think the same thing myself. Which I actually saw some footage of Star Fox too. And I'm like, why did they not release this? It just looks like for that for that time period, it seemed like it would be really cool to play and have. Yeah, there's actually some really good, interesting stories out there. I I forgot if it was uh, Larry Bundy or if it was Slopes Game Room, but they actually did a story on YouTube about why Nintendo didn't release Star Fox Two. Um, and they totally screwed over the developer because Star Fox, the original Star Fox was not developed by Nintendo. It was developed Mm -hmm. by a company called Argonaut Software. And Mm -hmm. I guess they partnered with Nintendo. And I guess Nintendo was so impressed with the tech of this company that instead of just continuing to work with them, they basically tried to steal it from them. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, which is completely ridiculous. Like, you know, like Nintendo knew that they had to have this tech. You know, they, they couldn't just let this independent developer develop this stuff and then, like, decide to branch off to the PlayStation or something like that. Which, actually, there was a PS1 game that was developed by some of the original Star Fox creators, which uh, is another story entirely. But, uh, but yeah, and nonetheless, I would like to see this happen. But, mm-hmm. you know, we'll just see. We'll see what happens. 
Yeah, because I think Nintendo actually mentioned that beforehand when the NES Classic came out, mm -hmm. that they were going to end up going and having enough for people to actually buy at launch. And even then, I still think that it was stupid for them to be able to go and cancel the NES Classic, especially putting out such a small amount of units around the holiday time, because it was going to be a hot ticket item. And that was just going to be Nintendo's bread and butter. They were going to make a lot of money off of it. I don't understand why, how it is so many people have claimed like, oh, you know, Nintendo doesn't have to worry about money. They got this bank of Nintendo or whatever it is with all this other money they have stored away. Why is it that they couldn't have actually used that and ended up making more consoles in order to make more money to come in for them? Considering they knew it was going to be such a, be such a big item. I just, I, yeah, I just thought it was crazy when they decided that they were going to cancel it, but now they're bringing it back. So we'll see if they manage to redeem themselves with those. So let's finally talk about the non Nintendo news that we're going to talk about this podcast. So, um, <laughs> So there's okay. There's Player Unknown Battlegrounds. This game has been sweeping the world right now. Uh, they recently announced that it sold over 10 million copies. Um, so there's been companies that have taken notice of this, and they're coming out with their own, uh, basically competition for this. So there's Grand Theft Auto, of course. They had the new Smugglers Run. Uh, stuff that they came out and they have their own take on it, but it's a team based take. It's not one on 99 people, like everybody against each other, you know, right? You actually have teams in the Grand Theft Auto, so it's not exactly the same thing. It's more of a like it has that concept of kind of parachuting in and stuff like that and you know, fighting in a huge open world, but it's teams, you know, so essentially it's just like playing a normal Grand Theft Auto deathmatch, except in a lot bigger map, essentially. Um, now there's another game that recently came out. It's called Fortnite. This is actually the newest Epic Games uh, game, and it's a really interesting shooter that uh, combines that with like crafting and open world, like horde exploration kind of stuff. So you can actually build buildings and stuff like that in this game, and you deal with hordes of enemies and stuff like that. It's getting its own player unknown battleground style gameplay uh, with Hunter Man Last Man Standing, but with the mechanics of this game and by Epic Games, which is a much better like studio in terms of infamy, right? Like this company that makes player unknown, I forget the name of the company, like Bluebird or something like that. They just popped out of nowhere, you know? And they teamed up with this famous online gamer, Player Unknown. Uh, whereas Epic has been around for over two decades. I mean, this is the company that Cliff Blazinski put on the map, putting out games like Gears of War and Unreal Tournament. And now they're jumping in on this. This is really interesting. I'm really wondering if this might uh, kind of stave off the fervor of Player Unknown Battlegrounds, or if maybe. This won't be enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you do a lot of multiplayer shooting games or? Um, honestly, no, no, I don't. I mean, it's just like I mentioned before, if it's not dealing with like the MMORPG space, I really don't mess too much with multiplayer. I may dabble in it from every now and then, like say with maybe Uncharted 4 multiplayer or something yep. like that. I mean, but other than that, no, I don't, I don't really, really dabble in that. I got you. Well, in, in a way, this does have some MMO aspects to it, I would say. Mm -hmm. You know, just because of the fact that it's a it's a massive world, you know, it's not like a confined thing, you know, so it's a lot more open like an MMO. It just doesn't have that constant progression. It's literally a game of survival. You land on the map, you use what resources you can find, and you take out the other players to be the man on top. You know, that's the objective every time. And, of course, with the player known Battlegrounds, it kind of builds on this dynamic by shrinking the map slowly as you progress through the game. So the map gets smaller and smaller. So if you're that person that tries to hide at the edge of the map and camp, well, you're going to have to eventually move your ass, you know, if you want to stay in the game. Oh, yeah, right? absolutely. And that can expose you to other players and they'll see you and maybe they'll take you out instead, you know, and, you know, instead of you camping the whole game, right? That's true. Um, but, you know, I'm kind of curious if this game will have such a mode like that or if it's not going to have that. And if it doesn't have that, how they're going to balance the game for it to not take forever. <laughs> you know, 
Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah, it, it, I can I just see this kind of continuing because of the competition that there's there's going on. But if Epic is successful here, it makes me wonder if maybe Microsoft made a bad call on backing player unknown battlegrounds because this is a game that you can play on everything else. The PS4 and PC have it. Everything has this game, Fortnite. So like you know, at that point like whatever money or whatever that Microsoft might have coughed up for exclusive, you know, exclusivity of player known battlegrounds and console will even be worth it, you know, like if somebody else comes out with something that first comes out before this player known does for Xbox and does it better too. Like what would be the point of even getting that game then? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That's definitely true. Yeah. Of course, hmm. you know, it's tough to say if it'll be better. Uh, they're having, I think it's September 26th or something like that. They're going to have the update that's going to make this available. They're doing a public test. So it sounds like it's probably going to be buggy. But I've seen player known Battlegrounds footage, and that's not exactly a polished game either. So it'll be an interesting race to the top. So, guys, welcome back to the DP and Me podcast. I've got Ravenous Spectre here, and we're going to do rapid fire this or that. Our guest today, he needs to select what he prefers quickly, or else he gets the buzzer. So, let's start it off with a nice and simple choice. Batman or Superman? Uh, Batman. Okay. And would you say... Heath Ledger or Jack Nicholson? Jack Nicholson. Okay, good choice. And how about this? Would you say Jack Nicholas or Jack Sparrow? Jack, oh, no, Jack Sparrow. Oh, got that buzzer, man. <laughs> but let's go down that route. Okay, so uh, you're a fan of Johnny Depp, I assume? Uh, I didn't even know where to go with, with Jack Nichols. Who, who exactly is Jack Nichols? He's a golfer. <laughs> He's a golfer. Okay, well, I think the better, better version then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean. I'd rather he, choose a pirate. <laughs> I gotcha. I gotcha. Um, okay. And so I've got one last one for you. So. Yeah. So what is a better movie? Alice in Wonderland or The Lone Ranger? Uh. I'll say, I'll say <laughs> well, I guess I would probably be picking uh, the Lone uh, Ranger, considering it seems like it's more of a uh, interesting concept. I guess you could say. Ah, uh, geez. Well, I mean, I guess that's a really loaded question. That's not one you can't really answer good. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. The funny thing is, is I've never. It depends on which Lone Ranger you're talking about. Whether it's like the. New I'm talking one. about the Johnny Depp one because. Johnny Depp. <laughs> oh, okay. See, I, th- I thought you were probably talking about like the, I guess it's the, uh, there was like an older movie as well. No, no, that's a TV show, man. A TV show? Okay, yeah, yeah. I knew it was one of them. It had to be a TV well, show. Well, there you go. You like the Lone Rangers. What a terrible movie that is. But I just, I, it was a confusing question. It was too, so, uh, <laughs> so I'll get you that. But uh, that was the rapid fire this or that. That was a really fun little round. Uh, So let's go ahead and close out. There's two last news topics I want to cover today. Now, this one's huge because we just had the Nintendo Direct. Now, we found out all kinds of interesting things on the Nintendo Direct. They showed off the new uh, Project Octopath Traveler, of course, and uh, they got a demo that's playable now, which is really nice. And then, of course, they showed off all kinds of details for Super Mario Odyssey and with that. But this was not, these were not the big stories uh, with the uh, Nintendo Direct. As we know, Nintendo gets a lot of criticism for the lack of third-party games. And so people like to constantly bash Nintendo for the lack of... You can't get any of these big games. You know, you can't get your Call of Duties and Assassin's Creed and whatnot on Nintendo. They just never come out, you know. And um, it seems like that at least one third-party company wants to change that. And I've got to give props to Bethesda because they've got not just Skyrim coming to the switch 
which is a very competent looking version of Skyrim. Like, I mean, it's graphically top notch. It's definitely more like the Xbox One and PS4 version than it is the last gen versions. Like I saw some of the gameplay and it looked almost the same as like the Xbox One version, which is fantastic. I'm sure it probably runs at a slightly lower resolution and all that good stuff, you know, whatever it takes to run, you know, run it good. But nonetheless, it's an impressive looking version of Skyrim that I'm thinking about getting just because of that Nintendo content. But they are also bringing us Doom, the new Doom, not classic Doom that anything can run, the new Doom that's only on PS4, Xbox One, and PC. They are bringing that to the Nintendo Switch, which that is impressive in itself. Mm. Now, they had some footage. I'm not sure if that's the actual Nintendo Switch version of the game running, or if that's just some stock footage. But if that's the Nintendo Switch version, congrats, Bethesda. I think you may have cracked the code. You know, I think you just you you may be the top-notch developers for the Switch because it looks excellent. You know, um, and then of course, that's not even the biggest news because Doom's an old game. A lot of people have already played this game, but they announced another game that people have not played yet because it has not been released yet. Now, the Switch is getting a little bit later, admittedly. I think that the success of the Switch has probably taken some of these developers by surprise. Maybe they could have had it ready in time if they had more faith, <laughs> unlike they did with the Wii U. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, in 2018, we will be getting Wolfenstein 2, the new Colossus, on the Nintendo Switch. And from what I understand... They're claiming that it is going to be an uncompromised version of the game. Like I said, I don't expect the graphics to be as good because it is a weaker system, but you can play it portably. On the Nintendo Switch, you cannot play a game with the caliber of Wolfenstein 2 on anything else portably. So if you're a hardcore gamer but you happen to have a lifestyle that maybe has you travel a lot or just not really get a chance to spend time with consoles or PC, you might need to start looking at Nintendo Switch because it looks like they're starting to get games that appeal to you. You know, that appeal to a lot of us hardcore gamers. So now I'm conflicted because uh, before I was just going to get it on PS4. But now that this is happening... I'm wondering if I should just wait until next year and get on the Switch because as long as it's not a bad version of the game, like I don't mind if the graphics are a bit crappy or whatever, as long as it plays the game well at a good frame rate and it doesn't have like a bunch of missing content and other kind of really crappy compromises like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, what do you think about that? Uh, honestly, <clears throat> I think one of the things that kind of gets to me is I would be definitely surprised if this if both Doom and Wolfenstein 2 manage to really run along the level of say the PS4, the Xbox One, and the PC. What would really be funny is if the Switch if the Switch version ran the best out of all of them, which would be hilarious. Which that's but, not going to happen because PC <laughs> is PC. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but then again, the thing is, is that. Uh, how is it really it's like you just mentioned how is it going to perform but then again how is it really going to look I mean are they probably going to go with a different graphical style possibly I mean I really could see something like what I really find interesting is I could really see a game like this not having that realistic look to it but maybe having like more of a cell shaded look to it to kind of give into Nintendo's aesthetic if you will which will probably piss some people off actually but I just think it would be an interesting mechanic to kind of add into Now that would be really better. That would be really interesting if they pull out like some weird kind of anime style look to it. Mm-hmm. But I don't see that happening. This is Bethesda we're talking about. This is probably like the least Japanese company there is in the industry right now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I would peg someone like EA or Activision being more Japanese than Bethesda. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that being said, um, yeah, that, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's Bethesda. We've seen what Skyrim looks like on the Switch. Skyrim looks great on the Switch. 
it arguably is probably the best looking game that we've seen so far on the Switch. Which may not be saying all that much because Skyrim is an older game now, but like I said, it's more on the level of the current gen versions, not the last gen versions. So, if they can manage to pull it off for a game that's a lot faster paced, like Doom or Wolfenstein 2, I'll be very impressed. Now the question is, will my fellow Nintendo fans support these games? Because the fact that these games are coming out is great, but if we don't buy them so that more of them come out, why even bother making them in the first place? Is it just because Bethesda just really likes a Switch? <laughs> you know, they just want a portable version of their games? <laughs> no, I believe that they're just trying to milk that tit for all that it's worth when it comes to dealing with, with uh, Skyrim. I mean, because they have put it out on so many different platforms, it's it's uncanny. I'm just like, man, Bethesda, go ahead and make go ahead and make Elder Scrolls 6. Just go ahead and do it. Leave Skyrim alone. It's been done to death. I'm pretty sure they're working on Elder Scrolls 6, though. But I'm, right. the Elder Scrolls series is one of my favorite series. And as soon as I find out that there's some either footage or info in Elder Scrolls 6, I'm just going to jump through the roof because I'll finally be able to hopefully see what they're going to be working on. But yeah, I mean, Skyrim, they, I think it's just a way for them to be able to make, make more money, honestly. That, that's how I feel about it. I mean, Nintendo's probably like, yeah, well, let's go ahead and and try to seem like nowadays um, with this new um, handheld console, if we can go ahead and really try to cater to the hardcore gamers once again. You know, we ended up getting guff from the hardcore gamers back on the original Wii and, and some on the Wii U. So let's really try to, to go that route because that's one reason why I think they're probably doing that with Wolfenstein 2 and also doing that with um, um with uh, Doom as well. They're really trying to not only have that usual casual family oriented crowd, but also trying to get more for the hardcore side. And the only way I really see them doing that at this point, besides them doing their own in-house stuff, their first party stuff is you're reaching out more to third party developers, which is what they should have done with the original Wii, but mm -hmm. it's good they're doing that now. And it seems like they're gonna be bringing some more mature titles over to the platform so they can really try to build up their fan base once again. Yeah, most definitely. Now, Doom on the Switch, it is going to have the actual single-player campaign built in. Uh, if you want to do multiplayer, you do have to have a separate download. Which, of course, that's another thing entirely some people are complaining about is that the Switch, you have to do separate downloads of certain things and whatnot. But crazy. if, you know, from my understanding, most people hated the multiplayer Doom anyways, so is that much of a loss? <laughs> so... Yeah. Right, and then um, unfortunately, Snap Map is not going to make it to the Switch. I, that's one thing I am disappointed about because Snap Map was a lot of fun. Um, but hopefully, Bethesda can figure something out and maybe patch it in later or something because that would be a valuable addition. But in any case, I'll consider Doom if it's a budget release. No way I'm paying sixty bucks for that or whatever it might yeah. be. But if it was like thirty bucks, sure, forty. Mm -hmm. Maybe if the money situation is good, you know, mm, uh, yeah. but uh, Wolfenstein, I imagine that'll be a full price game. Mm. Why wouldn't it be? It's going to be full price in the other systems. So, yeah, and it's just coming out. It's, I think it's supposed to be out later this year. So they're just going to go ahead and pop it out at the beginning of next year on, on the switch, which mm. I'll, I'll already be getting that on PS4 as well as, um, as well. Well, I already have doom on PS4 and I really loved it. I completed it, loved it. And I'm really anxious to see when they come out with the, the Wolfenstein too. Yeah, definitely. I'll get that on, on, um, PS4, but well, it'll be interesting to see how it's going to perform on the switch. That's for sure. Yeah. Like I said, if it, as long as they're not a GIMP version, cards are on the table, you know, mm -hmm. If it's like some broken version that's like 15 frames a second and all this stuff, then yeah. Like, let's play Doom, but let's play it with frame rates like GoldenEye for the 64. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, and so that's good. let's go ahead and close it out. So there's been a lot of YouTube controversy around a particular YouTuber who just happens to be the most popular YouTuber of all time. And in case you're wondering who that is, that's definitely Dark Side Phil. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> or not. Uh, more like it's PewDiePie. PewDiePie! Or whatever. PewDiePie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey guys, it's PewDiePie. <laughs> or whatever it is. Uh, I actually had a good... 
voice for him, but I just completely lost it. But anyways, PewDiePie, he says some outrageous things sometimes. I think mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty well established. Mm -hmm. He got in the middle of a live stream. I guess he got pissed off at the game or something like that. And he dropped a particular racist slur. Uh, well, maybe not racist. As in, I'm not saying he's racist necessarily, but it's something that a racist would often say. And uh, I think you guys might be well aware of what this story is about by now. So PewDiePie dropped the in bomb in the middle of a live stream. And then of course he realized very quickly after that the mistake he made. And then he decided to just kind of guy an asshole instead, which, you know, I mean at this point you've already dropped the racial slur. Now you're just associating with another bad word. But uh anyways, what's your take on this the whole thing? <sighs> well, Personally, um, I kind of find it to be kind of crazy that it has been sparking so much attention that it has, uh, um, you know, it, I mean, obviously, obviously it doesn't make it right. You know, I, racism of any kind is terrible. Uh, but I mean, the fact that it has been getting so much attention and has been getting hit home so hard like this, honestly, I think I think it's ridiculous. Like I said, it doesn't make it right at all. Um, but then again, for example, and I mean, I'm going out on a limb here maybe, but the fact is, is what about, say, some of these, these hip hop albums that we see or these rap albums that we see, or even pop music, for example, that ends up using this word and that completely just gets it gets overshadowed, nothing ever gets said about it. It's like, oh, it's pop culture, you know, it's out there. It's for the kids or something like that. You know, I don't know what the kids listen to nowadays. I listen to, to other music, I don't listen to pop. But the fact is, is if it gets out in there and, and it's out in mainstream media and all this stuff and hip hop music or pop music or rap music or whatever, and it's just treated like it's just any other everyday word, the fact that a popular YouTuber, you know, ended up going and saying this and and obviously he was he wasn't the wrong for doing it. But then again, with him getting so much into the game, he just kind of spewed it out. Yeah, it was wrong. But I just think that it's kind of crazy that it has just been completely blown out of proportion like it has, honestly. I mean, just just the fact of, of it being over over one word that has, has been used in these other types of media and nothing has ever, no backlash or anything has ever came out of them right? like it has with him. Well, okay, one thing we do have to establish is he's such a huge presence on the internet. Yeah. I mean, this guy gets millions of views per video. That's mm. more than a lot of major TV channels can get on some of their programming. Yeah. So he has the eyes and ears of a lot of people. And there's also something to keep in mind. The audience that watches PewDiePie is largely a young demographic. I know mm. a lot of people will make fun about, oh, all your fans are 12 year olds and stuff like that. Well, I'm sure that's not the case. I've actually talked to people that are my age, even older, that are PewDiePie fans. But yes, a large majority of people that watch his channel are younger. And so I think a lot of the controversy and outrage over this is that these kinds of people are being exposed to this. Now, who's this, like you said, the hip hop albums mm -hmm. and whatnot? Some of these people are going to be listening to that stuff, right? So it's yeah. like... How much, if they themselves kind of spout the same stuff, how much influence did PewDiePie actually have into that? That's a really good point, indeed. Um, but one thing I find really funny is that a lot of people have been deflecting this and saying that people like iDub say it too, you know, like iDub say this word all the time also, you know. Um, it's called context. I've seen the clips where iDub says this. He didn't say it like being all pissed off and stuff like that. It was like a comedic moment. You know, it was like a comedic delivery to it. You know what I mean? So yeah. there is a different context. And any kind of word 
whatever it is, context is very important in how it's used. That's not to say that there is never, or that there is always, there's a right way to use this word, but there's definitely a more wrong way than others. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah, uh, yeah, that's true. So, I mean, I just find it really hilarious that people deflect like that. Like, I think at this point, yes. You know, PewDiePie's, first of all, he apologized for this, which mm. he's apologized for stuff before. But then he ends up getting into some other controversy. It seems like every time his view counts slide, start sliding a bit, some other controversy happens. He gets that boost, it stays for a while, starts going back down a little bit, and so on. Now, he got hit hard with advertising stuff, but that doesn't really matter because he's got so many viewers. And even though, like I said, a large portion of his audience is young, the ones that are old enough to afford to cough up some money, they do. You know, he makes thousands of dollars every time he makes a live stream mm. and that's just him playing a video game and bullshitting and whatnot you know it's like what's the effort in that uh, i wish i could definitely do that and make millions and millions of dollars that would be amazing yeah I'd be so happy. <laughs> yeah i'm sure if he has a really good stream he probably makes more money than like a minimum wage person does for the entire year working their ass off yeah exactly. just off of one live stream you know which uh just crazy mm. but uh but that being said, um, you know, at the same time, there's also the other thing. You heard about the whole false DMCA controversy surrounding this? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay, so there is the developer of Firewatch, uh, Campo Santo, someone that represents the developer. They actually publicly stated on Twitter that, you know, they, they obviously were very upset about what happened too. And PewDiePie apparently covered their game got over 5.7 million views. So they said that they were upset over what happened and that they were going to take action on this, that they were going to file DMCA takedown notices on the videos that PewDiePie covered for Firewatch, as well as any future games that they may develop. And they were also going to contact their friends in the industry, including some that are bigger than them, to encourage them to do similar actions. That's where I have a problem. Yeah. Because yeah. YouTube has already had such a huge problem with DMC takedowns and things like that. Jim Sterling, for instance, was a victim of many false DMCA takedown notices from a company called Digital Homicide, which was a huge controversy. Jim fortunately came out on top, you know, because mm. simply he criticized this developer to a point where I guess they just got so pissed off that they took it personally and started attacking him where it hurts, you know, the pocketbook, started yeah. to attack his videos and things like that, which is just a really scumbag thing. But I guess he technically attacked their pocketbook by saying their game is shitty, which it was, which is why people realized that Jim was right, because... It wasn't like Jim was saying this about a game like Super Mario Galaxy, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, you know, at, at this point, you know, it's just ridiculous that these developers are doing this, you know. So I actually told the developer, Campo Santo, you know, that you officially hit my boycott list, you know, that I will never buy anything of yours, you know, never play anything of yours. I have a personal boycott list where I boycott certain companies. Campo Santo has joined that list, which is very small right now. Uh, I can't even think of everything that's on there right now, but the biggest one is probably Gearbox. Like, I'm not going to touch anything Gearbox does unless it's used or free from a Humble Bundle or free from PlayStation Plus or Xbox Gold. I'm not doing anything that will actually give them money anymore. And that's because of the way... Gearbox has treated not one, but two franchises that I hold dearly. Duke Nukem and Aliens. And Duke Nukem was one of my favorite first-person shooter games. You guys screwed with him. But I kind of like was semi... Okay, you guys were only involved in the last year or so development. Maybe I'll let that one slide a bit. Maybe you guys were just glad to see it be released. Right? That it came out at all. 
But then they did what they did with aliens, colonial marines. And that was just unforgivable being a big fan of the aliens series. You know, that is unforgivable. The only way that I can potentially do anything related to Gearbox is if they completely get rid of Randy Pitchford. If they fire him, if he sells off all his stock, if he has absolutely nothing to do with the company, then I can consider purchasing their products again. You know, mm-hmm. but until that happens, I'm never going to buy a Gearbox game, not even for somebody else. Like, you know, like if I have a friend or whatever, that's a really big fan of Borderlands or something like that, I'm not going to buy that game for them. You know, if they want to play that game, they'll have to buy it with their money. If you know what I mean. Right. So, yeah, but Campo Santo has joined that very short list now because of their whole way that they're doing this, because False DMCA takedowns is terrible. Hell, we even have Anita Sarkeesian agreeing with us on this issue. And we know how strict Hell, she is. Are. We know how crazy she is when it comes to video game uh, culture. Yeah, and even yeah. she's against this. She so, play games. <laughs> <laughs> so and, uh, that just tells you if you've got people on virtually every side that's against this then you're probably on the wrong side if you're for it, you know? Yeah, it's really crazy to know that Anita is, the, is it, of all people, joining up with something like that, knowing knowing how she is. I just, I figure she probably would have been on the bandwagon to, to be a, against uh, PewDiePie. taking down PewDiePie's videos as well. Yeah. I right, think, which I think she, she cleared in her statement. She cleared in her statement that, you know, PewDiePie is wrong, you know? Yeah. He's not worthy of support, but she said that that's not the answer. That's not how we should address it. And uh, that's a very good point, you know. Of course, I see people like from the Kekistani culture, you know, like uh, they, they just couldn't stand, like it blew up their minds. So they have to reject that that happened. I was telling them, well, hey, even a broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs> you know, so. mm-hmm. yeah, that's true. So. You know, it's kind of funny that you mentioned about the whole boycotting deal as well, because when I had mentioned previously about me uh, enjoying Mass Effect Andromeda, there <clears throat> I, I didn't know about news that came out after the game was released. I was excited mm-hmm. to get it. I went ahead and bought it full price, played it, and was enjoying it. Yep. But then I started to realize about some social justice warrior stuff that was happening in there, and then I also found out that there was a guy on there who was racist, who was on Twitter spewing out racist comments. Oh, and yeah. That. And I think he, I don't know if he was fired. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know you're talking about somewhere. Manveer Singh. Oh, yeah. I totally forgot. Yeah, Bioware is on that list, too. Not yeah, not I, EA as a whole, but Bioware specifically is on that list. Yeah, and, and when I when I found that out, I was like, shit. I was like, if I'd have known this beforehand, yeah. I said I wouldn't even I wouldn't even have bought Mass Effect Andromeda brand new. I would have bought it used so the Bioware could get none of my money and that racist bastard wouldn't have been able to see none of my money either because I was yeah. like, gosh, I was like, if it just came out previously, then I then I wouldn't even have bothered. I wouldn't right. have used, used. I got gotcha. you. So, Which I mean if you could have been patient, you could have got it used pretty cheap anyway. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely true. They're definitely true because no one, no one, how it, it was. Uh, a lot of people were being disappointed. So yeah, but I think that guy is no longer with the company. If I'm not mistaken, I have to look, look that up just to be uh, sure. No, I don't. I don't believe he is. Yeah, uh, I don't know if he got fired or if he quit or whatever. If he went to some other company uh, or whatever it may be. But yeah, I was like, shit. I was like, gosh, I wish I would have known that <laughs> or earlier. I mean. Right. Yeah, I think he left Bioware after that game, like, finished production or something like that. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know. Like, his, uh... Oh, it's Manveer Air, not Manveer Singh. I apologize for anybody that's named Manveer Singh. <laughs> don't go after them. <laughs> they didn't do anything wrong that I know of, at least. Uh, yeah, Manveer Air, that's right. And I'm blocked from viewing his tweets, so I can't see what he's up to, but, uh, <laughs> which I'm sure it's, you know, like with a lot of people that I'm blocked, it's because of previous association with Gamergate, which I have nothing to do with anymore because a lot of people that were pro Gamergate were also toxic people and I want nothing to do with them either. But mm-hmm. just because I had any kind of association at all with them in the past, well, I'm just blocked anyways, you know, 
There's just a lot of toxic people on both sides. That's all there is, pretty much, to it. Yeah. Welcome to the internet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, he was apparently uh, he was apparently dismissed from Bioware. Um, just read an article yeah. about that. Yeah. So oh, that's good. good. So Bioware is no longer on the uh, boycott list for me. You know, mm, uh, yeah. but uh, anyways, I think that's all we have time for today. This was a really good show. Uh, mm -hmm. I really enjoy talking stuff with you gaming wise and whatnot. And uh, it's been a really fun show. So I just want to remind people, check out this guy, Ravenous Spectre. That's R-A-V-E-N-O-U-S-S-P-E-C-T-R-E. -E -E. Yes, I have a good spelling vocabulary <laughs> or you could just look at the link in the description of the podcast click on the link um and check this guy's channel out let's get him above 100 people let's let's get him to that three digit mark on youtube all right and of course um if you guys want to check out any past episodes of the podcast that are not available anymore at itunes or podomatic or stitcher you can check those out on YouTube as well. Just search for the DP and Me podcast playlist, and you'll see all the episodes from the original air date on. And there's also a playlist clip uh, as well, where you can just check out specific clips of the podcast as well, in case you want nice short little things, because you don't want to watch a YouTube video for two hours. <laughs> but do uh, <laughs> you have anything else you want to say for your closing thoughts, or...? Uh, um, not really. I was just, uh, I, I want to appreciate the fact that you just allow, allow me on your show and be able to talk games and whatnot. And, uh, you know, being able to, to share my channel and, um, share thoughts and whatnot with your audience. And, uh, yeah, good show. Uh, yeah. definitely glad to be here. Yeah, pretty good. We did go on a little political tangent at the end, but, uh, <laughs> I, I, that just tends to happen when you're talking for a long time. Yeah, that's true. So, but that's anyways, true. we're out people. Down Phoenix, out. Later, taters. So thank you for tuning in to another episode of the DP and Me podcast. I'm DP, a.k.a. Down Phoenix. You can listen to us on YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, and Podomatic. Check the description for ways to listen. But that's all the time I've got for. I'd like to thank Ravenous Spectre for hopping in on the podcast. And I'd like to thank you very much for listening. But till then, Down Phoenix, out.